Hello, hello, and welcome to episode three, bonus episode three of Halloween fun, Halloween food, Samhain, Dia de los Muertos. That's right. We are celebrating recipes from past newspapers that have to do with this season. And particularly because we're in October, we're looking at sweets and weirdnesses and things of the past as they come from newspapers that I found on newspapers.com. Now this week I am flying without a net. I am not working from a script at all. And that's because I'm working on and looking at and sharing with you recipes that come from 1932. Why 1932? And why does 1932 matter? Well, any of the recipes that I could find between October of 1929, and pretty much the beginning of the Second World War would be appropriate. Because Does anybody out there, American history student, raise your hand, call out your name if you know what I'm talking about. Hello, anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? That's right, I'm talking about the Great Depression. From Black Thursday, October 24th of 1929, the stock market crash, through the beginning of World War II, when the production lines got up and running heavy, the boys went overseas and the girls went to work. There was an incredibly shocking level of nationwide poverty in this country. It touched almost everyone. Obviously, it did not touch the 1%. It never does. But it touched virtually everyone else in the nation. And it caused grinding poverty, fatal poverty among those who had the least. People talk about the past as if everything was rosy before and things are terrible now. And you know what? That's crap. It's not true at all. We're looking at life from 2018 and the people who were alive in the 1930s are advanced in age and maybe they're telling stories to you and maybe they're not. And maybe you have direct knowledge through your family members about what the depression was like and maybe you don't. I do. I've been told a lot of stories. I really feel them and I really feel for my ancestors who went through hardship during that period, especially my dad's mom and her people. And so what I did today was I sat down and I looked at my tree and I looked at comparatively what my mother's family was going through and what my father's family was going through at the exact same time. And the difference between their experiences is really kind of shocking. And then I thought about what's going on today and about the fact that there are people who have absolutely nothing right now. And there are people who have absolute comfort. And then there are people who have absolutely everything and they have no idea whatsoever about what anybody's going through. And you know what? It's really always been that way. So don't get fooled. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some specific recipes that are designed to help people who were in dire straits financially, feel better about themselves, as well as feed themselves decently. And the way that the newspapers did this, I think, was very interesting. It's kind of a psychological trick, as well as a trick with food. And that's really, really cool. So let's get into that, only Halloween style. All of the recipes I'm giving you today are from the Friday, October 28th, 1932 issue of the Miami News, which was published in Miami, Florida, obviously. And here's one of the things that I found really interesting about it. There is a donut recipe there. And I was like, well, okay, I've given them a donut recipe. They don't really need another one. And it's not quite as spicy and interesting. So I was like, meh, with the donuts, you know. But the thing that I found really interesting is that This is a lot less about sweets. It's not about games. It's not as frivolous at all. This is much more about sort of rib sticking food. And I thought about it for a minute and I thought, okay, Depression era food, 1932, we're really getting into the depths. This makes sense. Okay, so let's go with this idea of what's going on in 1932. So That's the lead in for what's happening here. So I decided to look at my family and see what was happening in 1932. In 1932, the difference between my mom's family and my dad's family was this. 
My mom's parents were already married, and they both came from solid middle-class backgrounds where the families had lived in their respective towns for multiple generations. My dad's family, it was a little different. His parents hadn't married yet because they were considerably younger. In fact, they were both still in school. My dad's mom's family had lived in a number of towns across Texas over a number of generations, and my dad's dad's family had started out in Kansas and Illinois just a generation before and had moved down through a number of towns to get to Texas. The generation before that, they were in still other states. They were moving to follow an industry, oil. So the idea of building network and the idea of having safety was slightly different. As a result, there was something more tenuous about my dad's ancestors' existence. And by the time we get to 1932, the year of these recipes, the year in which the Depression is well underway, my dad's people are in a much more treacherous position than my mom's. My mom's people had each other. My dad's people had each other. But my mom's people... They had the solidity of an entire community behind them and generations of people who knew them. My dad's, on the other hand, it wasn't quite the same. And the stories that I heard about my dad's family coming forward from 1932 and throughout the period of World War II are much scarier because it really was a very knife's edge existence for a while there. And that's why this period of time intrigues me so much because survival was very difficult for my grandmother in particular, raising my dad and his family. So I chose these recipes because they spoke to me about that era, about what it was that newspapers were trying to do in encouraging people to think both carefully and festively about feeding their families and about thinking in terms of celebrating Halloween and feeding in a way that's economical, but also still has that sense of elegance about it that was evoked in prior decades in these newspaper articles that we talked about in prior weeks. So here we go. Newspapers took this problem on, and not just newspapers, but also radio stations. And we're going to get into that for a moment because a couple of the recipes that are in today's newspaper issue that I'm looking at come from somebody called Colonel Goodbody. And I was like, well, who the heck is Colonel Goodbody? And it's the citations just say Colonel Goodbody. And I was like, well, all right, I got to look that up. Turns out that Colonel Goodbody is somebody who was cited by the A&P grocery store chain. Do you guys know A&P? A&P was the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company that came to be known as A&P or A&Ps. There was an A&P here in town until... I don't know, maybe 20 years ago they got bought out. We used to go to the A&P all the time. And so the (laughs) A&P had this really cool thing. First off, it was on paper. They provided these weekly series of recipes and menus that mothers or housewives or whomever could go into the store and pick up. And the idea was to preserve a notion of pride and gracious living, you know, something that looked like something that wasn't just here, feed your kids some gruel, you know, here's some porridge, make it last, you know, it was something a little bit more glamorous than that. And it helped also to feed the family on a very, very tight budget. So there's this, uh, this little press blurb about the Colonel, about Colonel Goodbody. And um, it's just, classic 1932. He's that kind of colonel. Food, says the colonel, is the gay hero of many a high adventure before it finally settles down to a domestic life in the kitchen. Now, we can't cramp the style of a man like that, for he talks about food as only a man who knows food and loves food can. And if he wants to make victuals romantic as well as digestible, more power to him. But we've got to be practical in this workaday world. You've always a dinner to plan, and we want to help. 
That's why we're printing the colonel's menus in advance. And from now on, the colonel can't work himself up as much as he wants to over interesting facts about food without wondering if you are getting the menu down. And you can listen to the colonel's stories and information in peace without having to jump for a pencil when he talks about the menu. Well, This menu was meant to go with a broadcast series, and the broadcast series was on NBC's radio network. Now, by 1932, people had radios, or they had access to a radio. They were still pretty expensive, but you could maybe listen in a store, or people could listen together if one family had a radio. Folks could gather around. And it was just like pre-cable or pre-DVRs, when you could go and sit down in front of the TV at 8 o'clock on a Thursday night, and you could count on watching a certain program. Same exact deal, only you're listening to a regularly scheduled program on the radio. And so what they did was they had these 15-minute food-oriented programs presented by Colonel Goodbody of the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. And they were recipes and menus, and the idea was to get people feeling okay about cooking and making recipes and making menus for the family on a reduced budget and not feeling ashamed and feeling like they had access to something that was better than just gruel or porridge. I think that's really pretty cool. And I think it's something that, you know, we forget about now, but that was actually very important at the time. There's another blurb about food and and sort of what these guys were in the business of doing here over at uh, A&P that I think is really important. It says, the business of being a mother. We can't help you bathe the baby, and we probably wouldn't be much of a success at hearing Johnny's lessons. But nevertheless, we know something of a mother's problems. We know it's no easy job bringing up children, cleaning house, and planning meals. We know that money's not always plentiful and that mother must be business manager, buyer, treasurer, and chairman of the board all at the same time. So we made up our minds long ago that we would search the world for the best of foods, bring them to our stores with as little expense as possible, and sell them at such a small profit that mothers could afford a variety and abundance of good, healthful food for their families." In that way, we've succeeded in improving the business of being a mother, even though we admit we wouldn't be of much help around the house. (laughs) That was A&P's sales blast on how they were going to be helping mothers to be better mothers because they understood it all. And Colonel Goodbody was their spokesman. So here's the Colonel's first recipe. It's for hot spiced cider. It's fairly simple stuff. It is one quart sweet cider, one quarter cup of sugar, one eighth teaspoon of salt, eight inch long pieces stick cinnamon, 12 whole cloves. Mix all the ingredients, bring to the boiling point, cool and let stand several hours. Strain, reheat and serve hot. That's from Colonel Goodbody. Here's another one from Colonel Goodbody. Squash donuts. Now this I thought was kind of interesting. This is more savory than sweet. And again, this is part of the focus where we're going for something a little bit more wholesome, less sticky and candy-ish. And partly it's because we're looking for wholesome food at a time where everybody's concerned about feeding their family and not feeding them junk. You have to remember, people were very concerned. People were starving. I've got to get this in here, guys. If you don't know United States history and you're doing United States genealogy, you need to stop doing the genealogy and you need to pick up some United States history books. Because if you don't know about the tenor, the color, and the texture of American history and the lives of the people that you're looking at, you need to stop. You have to know what it is you're looking at. What are the motivations of why your people moved from point A to point B? What were their lives like when they were living in a certain place? What were they doing? Why were they doing it? It's not just about looking at the census record and seeing, oh, so-and-so was in the grain business. What was the grain going to? Who was buying it? What was that about? Who did it feed? Whose beer was it making? Who was drinking the beer? You need to know about 
the businesses that your ancestors were in, the real pressures that they faced. We can't let ourselves get so caught up in being correct about don't have any punctuation in the fields where the names are. And you know that I'm all about that, right? No period after an initial. Yeah, I'm about that. But if you get so caught up in that, that you're not learning about the history, then you're missing the point. Okay, so back to the recipe. The recipe is for squash donuts. Still a donut. Two tablespoons shortening, one cup sugar, one egg, one half cup cooked squash. I think any squash would do for this. One half cup sour milk, three and a half cups flour, two tablespoons cornmeal, one half teaspoon soda, which is baking soda, four teaspoons baking powder, one half teaspoon salt, one quarter teaspoon nutmeg or cinnamon, one half teaspoon vanilla. Cream the shortening and sugar together and add the well-beaten egg. Add the squash, either canned squash or freshly cooked squash rubbed through a sieve, which would be grated, and the milk. Mix and sift the flour and remaining dry ingredients and add to the first mixture. Add the vanilla and a little more flour if necessary to make a dough that can be handled. Chill the dough, turn out onto a floured board, roll about a third of an inch thick, and cut with a donut cutter. Fry in fat which has been heated to 370 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to brown a cube of bread in a minute. This recipe makes three dozen donuts. So Colonel Goodbody is looking for us to make something that is definitely autumnal. You could go with zucchini here. You could go with pumpkin. You could go your own way. I think you could make it what you want it to be, and that's pretty cool. Now, this is the part that really surprised me in a section that is definitely and absolutely all about Halloween, chicken pot pie. Cool. And this is not attributed to anybody. So I don't know where they got this for this particular page and this particular section on this particular day. Four tablespoons butter or chicken fat, four tablespoons flour, one cup chicken stock or water, one and a half cups milk, one teaspoon salt, one quarter teaspoon pepper, one to three cups of chopped celery cooked, two cups diced chicken cooked, two tablespoons chopped parsley. By the way, the one to three cups of chopped celery cooked, I think that that's a a way of stretching out the recipe if you need to. Just a little note. Melt butter and add flour. Add stock, milk, salt, and pepper. Cook until creamy sauce forms. Stir constantly. Add rest of ingredients and cook two minutes. Pour into shallow buttered baking dish and cover with biscuits. And then here's the biscuits recipe. Two cups flour, four teaspoons baking powder, one to three teaspoons of salt, four tablespoons of fat, the fat of your choice. Ooh, the possibilities. Two to three cups of milk. Mix flour, baking powder, and salt. Cut in fat with knife. Mixing with knife slowly, add the milk. When soft dough forms, place it on floured board or paper and pat out until dough is half inch thick. Cut out biscuits and arrange side by side on top of chicken mixture. Bake 25 minutes in moderate oven. Okay, our last recipe is Halloween gingerbread. Now this is definitely Halloween-y. One half cup shortening one half cup sugar, one cup black syrup, molasses would work here, one well-beaten egg, two and a half cups flour, two teaspoons ginger, one teaspoon cinnamon, one teaspoon nutmeg, two teaspoons salt, two level teaspoons baking soda, one cup boiling water. Cream, butter, and sugar, add beaten eggs, syrup, and alternately add sifted dry ingredients. Add the soda to the boiling water before mixing. Bake in a modern oven. I think they might mean moderate. (laughs) As if you're keeping an old oven and a modern oven in the same kitchen. That's probably a typographical error. And this is sourced as Burdine's Sunshine Cookbook. 
don't know Burdine's. And again, I didn't Google anything off this recipe before I sat down. So that would be an interesting thing to take a look at. Somebody wants to look that up and get back to me on that. I will read the follow-up on the next episode. So that would be totally cool. So that's what I've got for you this week. But I definitely want to highlight this. We don't talk about it enough, but it is very important. Pay attention to history, you guys. Seriously. YouTube is a really, really good source for documentaries. It's a great place to go to find old stuff from the History Channel. And American Experience is a really, really good series. If you don't know your 20th century history, you are really doing yourself a serious disservice. If you don't know your 19th century history, you are really, really, really doing yourself a serious disservice. Things change so rapidly in the 19th and 20th centuries as a result of automation and as a result of population growth. You have to know why things happened the way that they did. So please be sure to remember that when you are a genealogist, whether you are a professional, you intend to be a professional, or you're just doing it for a hobby on the weekend, you are also a researcher, which means you need to Google the crap out of absolutely everything before you ask anybody to look something up for you. No excuses. You need to use multiple search terms and do multiple Google searches before you even begin to think about asking anybody for help. Seriously, guys, research. This is a research job. And secondly, you're not just a genealogist. You're a historian. You're a social historian. You're a cultural historian. You're a folklorist. You're a religious historian. Genealogy is like taking every single study of everything that has to do with people and dropping it in a blender and hitting high, pouring out the shake and taking a sip. That is what genealogy is. So please keep that in mind. And also keep in mind that it's the season. It's the season of haunts. And I've still got a couple of weeks to come and get you. I apologize for being late on this episode and for skipping a week, but I have been ill. Nevertheless, I've got more regular episodes coming at you soon. So keep your ears peeled because they're coming when you least expect them. That's right. Ooh. Expect surprises.